Hi, I'm Chaplain Charlotte Wharton with the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office. And I'm Chaplain Larry Crabtree, Chaplain of the Maryland State Police and St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office. In the last segment, we were talking about police suicide, and this is something that is so important and really so um, so heartfelt for us that we really felt it needed two segments. Larry, we, we've taken a look at some of the, the statistics showing that law enforcement officers take their, li their own lives at an, an alarming rate maybe even as much as two to one, depending Correct. upon which statistics that you look at. Um, and I think in the, the last segment, the, what we wanted people to walk away from with was the idea that this really is not the solution. Yeah. There has to be something that is done. We want to pick back up on this discussion and, and I want to ask you, why is this a problem in the profession? Yeah, I, I want to go back again. And again, this is probably the hundredth time we've talked about this. But once again, I want to state the common and major contributor to police suicide, but I don't care who it is or how many there are, you're going to find this thread through them all, is that officer's inability or absolute refusal to seek any help or assistance. So first of all, I think the biggest problem that's got to be overcome is a culture within law enforcement that I am not going to ever be vulnerable and let anybody know that I have a problem myself or I need some help. That's got to stop. Now, I don't know what all the answers are and how we do that. I have some suggestions, but I do have to say that's a problem. And that's got to be the first thing put on the table that says we need to fix this. Talk about how administration and individual administrators play a role in this. Well, I think if we could talk to administrators, and again, we're talking very respectfully um, and, and with caring hearts here, but as I've done some study on this, I, I've learned that statistically what we're seeing is that um, supervisors and administrators play the biggest and the most powerful role in helping alleviate the, the mental health and emotional health if issues of police officers. And that's a, a profound statement when you realize this, that administrators and supervisors really are the key to bringing wellness to those they oversee. And, and again, that's not a Larry Crabtree statement, that's what studies showing. That in fact, that, that a supervisor, an administrator, that is able to convince and demonstrate to, to their police officers that they genuinely care about them, that they have their best interest at heart, that they uh, are supporting them in every way, that when that officer knows that that supervisor feels that way about them, it is like magic salve, and it takes away a lot of these negative effects of trauma, of this chronic, long-term cum cumulative stress. It just kind of alleviates it and pulls it away, and a supervisor can do that better and more profoundly than their friends and peers or anyone else. That is a powerful thing. And so I, I think some discussion has to take place within agencies and law enforcement that can assist, because administrators and supervisors are already crazy busy. They have a lot in their plate. And so they're gonna hear me say something like this, and go, oh, how in the world can I you know, do that too? And, and I think, we talked a little bit about this earlier, I think it's a, a mentality shift pr from being a manager to being a leader. And a manager, basically, you're, you're doing stuff. You're taking, you're making widgets. You're moving one to the other. But when we're talking about being a leader, we're talking about it's your job to educate, assist, and make possible for an individual to be the per best person they can be. And if somehow in law enforcement we can help make a shift, I think that might do a whole lot to alleviate some of this growing uh, police suicide that we're seeing and the great consequences that are coming. So once we establish the need to have the conversation and realize that supervisors and really uh, co-workers have a responsibility to each other yeah. to watch after each other what are some things that can be done at that point to help deal with the the issue well you know you're bringing up a, an important question i think we're talking about this is a serious deep issue it's very complex and one of those things maybe we just mentioned that um that your comrades that fellow officers share responsibility in, in caring for each other, overseeing each other. Well, somebody might ask, yeah, but you're talking about, I mean, what if I see this in a friend, um, they don't look healthy, maybe, maybe I'm getting this idea, they're thinking about taking their life. I mean, 
what do I say? What do I do? What's the responsibility? And I think we'd all be honest and say, you know, that, that's a difficult place to be in. That, that's a hard place and a, and a difficult decision to make. But one of the things I guess I'd say, and I'm not saying this callously, and, and I'm not saying this, you know, without any feeling or flippantly and, and blowing away the real issues, but stop and think about it. Even in the worst case scenario, if, if this individual that you're, you're trying to deal with yourself and you know they need help, if you go and get them help, and of course, they're not necessarily going to like it or, or see the value in that. Uh, and so a lot of times we're tempted to not do anything. But think about it. Which is more devastating? To lose your gun and your career or to lose your life? I, I think the answer is pretty obvious. That life is a lot more valuable than a career and a gun. And I realize, oh my word, I can't believe you're saying that, but it's, it's the truth. And I think, and I, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying I have the answers, or I even want to be in that place. But these are the kind of issues I think that we have to address and talk openly about, because we care about each other. I also think that we train officers to go out and to assess suicidal people in the community. We need to be doing that with the people that we're closest to as well. Yeah. And I think the, the number one question that, that we need to be asking in our profession is that same question that we're asking in the community. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Yeah. Not, are you thinking about hurting yourself? It is that point blank question, are you thinking about killing yourself? Because that is going, that response to that question is going to send it whichever direction it needs to go. Yeah, but so many are afraid to ask that question because it could go in the direction we just talked about. And again, we have to somehow get over that because it's done out of love. It, it, it isn't done to destroy. It's done to protect and to build up. And so these are just some of the realities, I think, that we need to be thinking about. Again, we don't have the answers to all this. It is a big and complex question and issue. but. But it's really, really concerning. And as we finish up this segment, I think it's important that we mention if you are struggling with suicide, yeah. if you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, now is the time to get help. And whether that is to call one of us, whether that is to reach out to human services, whether that is to talk to your sergeant or to an administrator, I don't care how it gets started, but it's got to start today. And to be honest with you, what is our catchphrase at the end? It's always be strong and be, and be safe. safe. What we're talking about is being strong and being safe. It's not weakness. It's strength to overcome these big, big issues that we're dealing with. It, it, takes, it takes someone of great strength and power to do that. Very tough, very deep subject, but something yes. that we have to talk about as a profession. Yeah. Well, Charlie... Let's wrap it up with the very phrase that we just used. And what we really want for all of you is to be strong and be safe.